you all for coming today. Um, this is wonderful crowd. Thank you. Um, I want to introduce our speaker today. Also, before I get started, I want to thank our sponsors for this month, who are uh, John Bird and Graham Sweeney. And Ron is going to be talking today about Roosevelt and Churchill. And he was a, um, in addition to being on the museum's board at one time, he also ran the Board of Economic Development over in Richardson and Greenville, and has done a whole bunch of other things as well over his years. Um, and he's also traveled a lot, he, which is, I think, what got his, some of his interest in World War II started. He's been to Normandy, southern France, England, and Germany, um, often while he was on business in Europe, and of course tied that into some vacation time, and personal time. So while he was over there, he explored World War II sites and also talked to people who um, lived during World War II and, um, while he was over there. And so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Ron. Thank you, Susan. Appreciate that introduction. Just like my mother helped write it. Okay. Um, come on in if you want to come in. Well, thank you all for being here. And if you can't hear me, just raise your hand and I'll try to speak a little bit louder. It's a pleasure to have all of you here today to talk about a topic that I found very fascinating and very interesting over the course of many years. Before we get started, though, we had three handouts for you, and I hope all of you got a copy of them. And the first one we're going to be referring to in the presentation, but the slide on the screen is kind of is not the best in the world, so I said make a copy so you'll have a copy of that, and I'm going to be talking about this particular page, this map of Europe, uh, in just a few minutes. The second one is the same idea, that's this one, and you can barely read it, and you can't read it very well on the screen, and we just discovered this today. And so, what is important, and I'm going to tell you when we get there, the bottom half of this, forget, forget it, it's the upper half that I'm going to be talking about. And that upper half relates to how the military was organized. Uh, in England and the United States and how the military worked together in World War II. And finally, something we're very proud of that we just announced here in Greenville in the last month or so, and that is the formation of a World War II roundtable here in Greenville. It's named the Audie Murphy chapter of uh, the World War II roundtable, and this program will kick off in 2024 hopefully with four programs throughout the year, where we're going to bring in noted published historians um, from around the state and nationally uh, to talk about World War II. And they will bring with them their bona fides of publishing books, faculty members at universities, that sort of thing. So we're going to try to raise the level of this thing from someone like me who, who has an avocational interest in history to those who really know history. And hopefully that will bring a lot of folks to Greenville uh, for what we're going to try to do. So that's the third page. And if any of you have any interest, uh, see me afterwards, and we'll be happy to share more with you. Um, and I'll be happy to explain more about, about the three, uh, about, the, about that third sheet. OK, Roosevelt and Churchill, world World War II political and military disagreements. 1940 to 45. Why 1940? Because that's when Churchill became prime minister in May of 1940. The war had been going on for a year. It started in September 1939, but Churchill was not prime minister at that time. And it goes to 1945, actually April 1945, and that's when President Roosevelt dies. So their relationship was basically five years, not quite five years. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in another slide. But that's the framework, 40 to 45. And we're really going to be talking about military disagreements, political and military disagreements, in four areas, pre-Pearl Harbor. You know Pearl Harbor was December 7, 1941, 
so Churchill was prime minister at that time. And um, so from pre-Pearl Harbor, uh, uh, there were some disagreements between Roosevelt and Churchill about helping England. Remember, England goes to war in September of 1939 with the invasion of Poland. So Churchill and Roosevelt are working together a little bit from 1939 through 1940, 41 until Pearl Harbor occurs. So we're going to be talking about pre-Pearl Harbor issues and problems. We're going to be talking about invasion plans from the very beginning after Pearl Harbor. The discussions began within a month of how to invade Europe and defeat Germany. And this goes on clear up until the invasion, almost to the invasion, to the D-Day invasion on June 6th. And I forgot to mention at the beginning, today is the 79th anniversary, right, of Pearl Harbor. I think that's correct. D-Day. 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 Of D-Day. Yeah, I'm sorry. Of D-Day. So we're going to be talking about these invasion plans that they had major disagreements over. And that's part of the reason why you got a map, because I'm going to point to that. And then interestingly, entering the fray, when the United States enters the war on December 7th, or actually December, um, the, the week of December the 7th, um, a, new, a new person appears on the scene, and that's Joseph Stalin. And so from that point on, you have Roosevelt, Churchill and Stalin, and actually Stalin enters the picture in um, in May June of 1941 when Germany invades Russia, and so he enters the picture. And there's some disagreements between Roosevelt and Churchill on how to deal with Stalin, and finally. Um, as the war moves closer and closer to conclusion, and both Churchill and Roosevelt sense that um, both Germany and Japan are going to be defeated, they begin thinking about the post-war world. And, um, and there's some disagreements on all of that. So we have this incredible relationship that one historian by the name of Nigel Hamilton. He's probably the number one historian on Roosevelt and Churchill's relationship. He considers their relationship to be the number one relationship between political leaders in all of the 20th century. And the decisions that Roosevelt and Churchill made back then still impact us today. So uh, one would think then all of that would be very positive, very, everybody's uh, happy and working together, and they made all these joint decisions in a very upbeat, positive way, and we all live happily ever after. That's not true. Now, there's a lot of disagreements on how disagreeable they were, but there have been books written about this, and I brought one of them today to share with you at the end of the program. So, Let's go ahead and uh, get into the program. Uh, well, first of all, I wanted to show you some pictures. This happens to be Church of Roosevelt. Um, at, um, uh, they met on a ship um, in, off the coast of Canada. And um, this was before, actually before the war. And, uh, and uh, they met to discuss the problems that were going on in the war. And uh, Churchill, is, this is the first time he's meeting Roosevelt. Actually, it's the second time. He met Roosevelt back in the 19, in 1918, believe it or not. And it wasn't, a, uh, and uh, Roosevelt uh, uh, wasn't impressed with Churchill, and Churchill wasn't impressed with Roosevelt. And so this is the second time that they met, and this is in 1940. Now what's interesting about this, part of the reason why we have it here, this is, this is Roosevelt's son. And of course Roosevelt's here and this is Churchill. And if you notice, Roosevelt's got a little paunch right here. Well that paunch is because he has a metal brace around his waist. 
that holds his, his legs and the braces go down and go underneath his uh, foot and the only way he can stand up uh, and that those, uh, those braces lock so he can only do this and what his son has done is help walk him out to this point. Roosevelt's left hand is on this railing and uh, so he's standing there greeting Churchill for the first time since 1918. Now, ratchet forward to the spring of 1945, and this is President Roosevelt uh, about a month before he died. He was in very bad health, and uh, he died in April, and we'll get to that slide in a minute. This is uh, Joe Stalin. This is uh, uh, at Yalta, and I included it because of this little saying down at the bottom. Meeting Franklin Roosevelt, this is Churchill, meeting Franklin Roosevelt was like opening your first bottle of champagne. Knowing him was like drinking it. A Winston Churchill. Now, Ro uh, Roosevelt was known as the happy, he was a very happy, pleasant uh, individual to talk with. If, if, you, if you see him around people, he's always got a smile. You remember he smoked a cigarette, and he had a cigarette that stuck out the corner of his mouth. Well, you can see it right there. No, I don't think so. That's not it. Anyway, he and Churchill were at Camp David. It wasn't called Camp David then. But they were there, and Roosevelt's trying to convince Churchill of two or three important matters that we won't get into now. So one of the things he did was he took him fishing. So he's got a fishing pole in his hand, and you can't see Churchill's fishing pole is here. And they're sitting along a stream, an actual stream, fishing. And, and Roosevelt's trying to convince Churchill to do things that Churchill doesn't want to do. Okay, now here's the map. And that's this is the map that you got. As you can see, you can't see it very well. Rick, why this map? Uh, this map in red shows you the fullest extent uh, the German forces occupied Europe and the uh, uh, eastern, uh, I'm sorry, the western part of Russia. Um, and I'm just going to briefly go through it. The, the first declaration of war was between Germany and Poland in, uh, in September 1939. In the spring of 40, Germany invades France first and immediately after the, and, and defeats France in six weeks. And a month later, they invade the low countries of Holland and the Netherlands and Belgium and Norway and Denmark. And so, and then Italy is in the war as an ally of Germany. And then, we've, uh, then the next year, in 1941, Germany is, goes down into, uh, uh, down into uh, Greece and the countries to the southeast of them, like Hungary, um, in that area, and, and they take over those countries. And then finally, in June of uh, 1941, uh, Germany invades Russia. And this is the extent of the Russian invasion. Well, the Ukraine and Belarus is part of Russia, too, at that time. And Moscow is about where the R is in Russia. So they occupied a huge portion of Western Russia. And, and all of this will remain the same until about, um, well, we'll get into that in a little bit. But that's, that's the map, and that's the reason I wanted to show you that map. And we're going to come back to it when we talk about some of the disagreements. Okay. Now, there's the third piece you have. And forget all this stuff down here. What this is, um, what this actually is, is the command structure, the joint command structure between England and the United States for the invasion of Normandy. And the bottom part all relates to Eisenhower and his people. So what, what I'm interested in showing you is how the United States and England decided to fight this war militarily. And what they did in uh, right after Pearl Harbor um, was uh, Churchill came to the U.S. and they sat down for a month with their staffs and they decided that they would combine their military staffs and their military staffs would be based in the United States and 
So Franklin Roosevelt's up here, Winston Churchill is here. The Combined Chiefs of Staff is what it was called. The United States was William Leahy, he was the chairman. George Marshall was the head of the Army. Ernest King, head of the Navy. Henry Arnold, the Army Air Force. And then the British side was Alan Brook from the British Army, and I won't mention the, the other ones. But it's this organization that managed and run World War II for the Allies. All right, there's Roosevelt and the highest ranking U.S. Army General in the U.S., uh, Lieutenant General George Marshall. He's the Chief of Staff of the United States Army. Um, he will play a major role in World War II, and he and Churchill doesn't get along oftentimes also. All right. And here's his counterpart with Churchill, Sir Alan Brooke. And this is a post-war photograph. And Brooke is famous for disagreeing with everybody. He didn't get along with Roosevelt. He didn't get along with Marshall. He didn't get along with Eisenhower, even though he was number two in command uh, at D-Day for the British. Um, and he was also promised the command for the invasion of Normandy by none other than Winston Churchill. Well, uh, Roosevelt had something to say about that and decided it was going to be an American. There's another story behind that. And that's how Eisenhower gets to the man. Okay. Here's a little bit about Roosevelt. Born in 1882, died in 45, married Eleanor Roosevelt. She was his fifth cousin. And so her last name didn't change. And her uncle was President Teddy Roosevelt. And he's the one that gave her away when she married uh, Franklin. Graduated from Harvard with a history degree. And certainly that helped him significantly in dealing with Churchill, who was also a historian of sorts. And they got along famously as they talked about history. Uh, he ran as a vice presidential candidate in 1920, got beat. Elected like governor of New York, 28, and elected like president, 32. And if you recall, the uh, Depression started in 29. Herbert Hoover uh, was the president then, and, and Roosevelt defeated Hoover in 32. And I mentioned a little bit, he first met Churchill in 1918. And uh, for a Roosevelt to meet a Churchill, and then 30 years later, Churchill doesn't remember meeting a Roosevelt. It's kind of the height of, uh, of making it not feel too good about him, and that's certainly the way Roosevelt felt at one time. In fact, uh, Churchill gets appointed prime minister in uh, in May of 1940, and and Roosevelt asks someone who had just gone over to visit him to come back and ask him if he was a drunk because Churchill was known for his heavy drinking. And uh, so Roosevelt wasn't too impressed with him right at the beginning. Uh, now, he never showed that, never. He was the kind of president that would never make anything of that uh, with Churchill. OK. Then here's Churchill, uh, born in 1874, only uh, less than five years after the end of the Civil War. Grandson of the Duke of Marlborough, if you know your English history, the Duke of Marlborough is quite famous. He married Clementine Churchill, 1905, five children, graduated from the Sandhurst Royal Military College in 1894, but uh, that's not a four-year college. It's a year, year and a half kind of thing. So he never actually graduated from a British university. Served as First Lord of the Admiralty in 1915, was cashier because of disastrous campaign. He was, a, he was a lieutenant colonel in the military, and I uh, won't bore you with the details, but it related to the Dardanelles, which separates Greece from Turkey, and he led a campaign down there, and it was bad, so he got fired. Um, and then he was selected as prime minister on May 10th, 1940. Why? Because it went to Neville. Neville Chamberlain was the Prime Minister, and he had negotiated the treaty uh, with Hitler on Czechoslovakia, um, 
and that turned into be a political disaster for him, and um, and so he was forced to <coughs> resign, and Churchill took his place. The day that Churchill became prime minister, Germany invaded France, and that's a key day when we start talking about. Roosevelt and Churchill working together. Um, and it only took six weeks for Germany to defeat France. The British were in France fighting the Germans. The end result of all of that was the British troops retreated to Dunkirk. You may have heard of Dunkirk. 250,000 of them. And the British organized a campaign to get them back to Britain, and they were very successful. Had they not done that, it would have been a totally different war, because of the cream of the British Army um, was on the beaches at Dunkirk. Um, now, interestingly enough, he, he plays, obviously, an incredible role in England uh, as a prime minister during the war. But there's an election in July after the war is over in May, and he loses. Now, he doesn't lose. His party loses, the Conservative Party. And in, under British political system, the party that wins the most seats controls the government and selects the prime minister. Well, he got beat. The Labour Party beat him, and there's books been written about that, how that could happen. But nonetheless, he got me. He comes back in, in the 1950s and becomes prime minister again. Uh, but that's another story. All right, here's an interesting thing about Churchill and Roosevelt. Their correspondence. Look at the number. There's approximately 1,900 when you add these up, this is, uh, there are 1,949 messages were exchanged between Churchill and Roosevelt during, beginning in September 39, now Churchill's not in the government then, but he's still talking to Roosevelt. And he, between then and 1945, there were 1,949 messages and telegrams from Roosevelt to Churchill, Churchill to Roosevelt. And they were kept secret by and large until October of 1984 by the U.S. government. And kind of interesting. Um, well, they were not allowed to be published, let's put it that way. Some scholars had access to it. Uh, there's a lot of disharmony, frankness, and strange arcs this, between the two you can find in these 1900 messages. But they were, they talked to each other almost, I think it averages 28 messages a month. So it's almost one a day. Um, none of these were sent by wireless, by the way. Uh, they were sent by undersea cables, and they were put in diplomatic pouches and taken across the seas um, to make sure that uh, they weren't intercepted by the enemy. Okay. The controversies. I don't have them all listed, but the date of when to enter Europe on the, which ultimately became Normandy, was a major controversy from the time of, of that Churchill and Roosevelt uh, were together in the war. In other, in other words, uh, the United States enters the war December the 8th. Churchill's been at war in 1941. Churchill's been at war, or England's been at war for a couple of years. So almost immediately, the discussion is, uh, well, we got to invade the continent. And that disagreement went on for three years. And we're going to talk about that more. The second disagreement was, well, if you're going to invade, where are you going to invade? That controversy went on for three years. With Churchill saying, here's what we ought to do, and Roosevelt saying, just almost the opposite. Um, and then I've talked a little bit about the uh, the uh, controversies of, of, of invading Europe 
and broken it down a little bit. Churchill said we need to go up the Italian peninsula, we ought to cross into the Alps and go into Germany from the south. The American military leadership and Roosevelt were very much opposed to that. Um, Churchill wanted also, at one point in time, he wanted to invade Greece. Remember that map we showed you? It's way off down at the eastern edge of the Mediterranean. And the reason that he wanted to invade Greece is he wanted to head off the Russians so the Russians would, would not occupy as much of Europe as they eventually did. There was a big controversy over who should command Allied forces. Eisenhower had led the combined British American forces in the invasion of North Africa, the invasion of Sicily. But somewhere along the line, before Eisenhower was appointed to command overlord, Churchill, as I mentioned before, promises that command to uh, Sir Alan Brooke. Brooke never forgave Churchill for not seeing that through. And that was part of the reason why Brooke, over the course of the war, after the war, clear up to the day he died, had a chip on his shoulder about World War II because he was denied the top position um, when they invaded Europe through Normandy. Um, then there's a post-Normandy issue uh, on the invasion of southern France. It's called Operation Dragoon. And again, I'm going to show you that on the map when we get to, I'm going to show you all of these disagreements again on this map because it's going to come back up. And then there is the Montgomery crisis and the march on Berlin. That's a, actually a military action that took place in 1940, late 44 and 1945. Uh, now, here is uh, an interesting slide. There was one meeting before the U.S. entered the war, the Atlantic Charter Conference in August of 41. That's the one, my first slide, I showed Roosevelt and Churchill meeting. It's, it's for that, that conference that took place. And, and it was actually to establish uh, the views of the democracies um, toward a world order. Um, and, and the view, that's not quite the right word, toward uh, after this war is over, how we'd like the world to be. And they talk about freedom of religion, freedom of press, freedom of, from fear, all of those kinds of things. It's not the Four Freedoms Conference, that was something else that we're not part of any of this. So then there's nine meetings between Roosevelt and Churchill plus their staffs during the war, nine of them. Um, and the first one is the one I just mentioned uh, earlier, 1940, December, January, 41, 42, is the first Washington <coughs> conference when Churchill <coughs> comes over to the U.S. after Pearl Harbor. He brings, he brings um, 30 or 40 people with him, and Roosevelt lets him live in the White House. He lives in the White House for two, a couple of weeks, uh, no longer than that, from uh, uh, December 21, I think, uh, to about January 15, something like that. So he actually lives in the White House, plus several of his aides, something nobody's ever done before. Um, so, and then over here on the right is the major decisions that they made at each one of those conferences. This one, they decided it was going to be a Germany first. They're going to defeat Germany first for a lot of reasons, we won't get into all of that, but Japan would be second. That was kind of tough on the Americans because who bombed us to get us into the war? Well, it wasn't Germany, it was the Japanese. So there's a lot of public opinion, a lot of political opinion that we ought to go after Japan first and let Britain handle their own problems. They've been in war for almost two years, um, so let them handle their own problems. Um, the second uh, conference doesn't have a name, uh, but they make a decision to invade North Africa. And this is one of the major disagreements between Roosevelt and Churchill. And when we see the map, we can show it to you again. But 
the American military said, we need to plan, start planning right now, in June 42. And it always was a single point invasion. In other words, you're going to pick a place and you're going to invade, and then you're going to spread out the armies as you move toward Germany and control everything as you get to Germany. Churchill says, I don't want to do that. He said, the best way to defeat Germany is we need to start nibbling away at everything she has, that she's taken over, and try to recover in little tranches, a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here, and we eventually will end up in Germany. Now, why did he feel that way? He felt that way because nearly uh, right at 400,000 British soldiers were killed in World War I. And Churchill was an officer in World War I. Another 180,000 or something like that were wounded. They lost so many men that the birth rates in England, as you get toward the late 30s, were impacted because they lost so many men. Um, so that was one reason. Uh, another reason was that he, he knew, Churchill knew, that in World War I, it had been a terrible war, it had been a land war, it had been a war of trenches, it had been a war of gases, gassing each other. It had been horrible for about three or four years. And if they invaded Europe somewhere in France, they're going to end up going through that same area they were in in World War I. Churchill was deeply concerned that if we needed, and, and it ended up in an impasse in World War I. Um, they were, they would fight a major battle and only move the battle lines a mile and lose 10,000. So Churchill was very much aware of this, and he was bound and determined that he wasn't going to let that happen again. So if they end up going through France, and we're all there together, and Germany is facing you from the east looking at you west, and you put everybody together like they did in World War I, it's going to be a new battle. Thirdly, the Germans in the invasion of France in 1940 had swept through France in six weeks, defeated the British completely and the French. 150,000 French troops were deported to Germany to work in the plants in Germany after um, the invasion of the when, when Germany was successful at, at, uh, in invading France. That's the same. So they go to Germany. The 250,000 go to Dunkirk and they get them back to England. So that's the reason Churchill says, I don't want to have a single invasion. He said, what I want to do is I want to start in Africa. And I want to go down there and kick the Germans out of North Africa. Rommel was down there. Rommel was trying to take the Suez Canal. He was trying to uh, defeat the British because the British had sent troops down there long story, I won't get off in all the details, but he says we need to nibble and we need to kick them out of Africa and we need to do it together. Well, the U.S. military said no. They didn't want to do that. Well, Roosevelt had a conundrum in front of him. Pearl Harbor bombed in December 41. And here we are in June of 42, and there hadn't been a US, any U.S. troops committed in battle anywhere. He was facing re-election. Uh, no, Congress, uh, not he wasn't facing re-election, but Congress were going to have elections in the fall. And he was in trouble politically for a lot of other reasons. So he gets to thinking about this, and he thinks, well, I got my, my troops need to be bloody. That's a military 
they need to be bloody. So Roosevelt tells his military, I think, uh, I think maybe Churchill's got something here. So he agrees with Churchill against the advice of Marshall and uh, decides they're going to be better. Now, to convince the Americans to go along with this, it's a very tense meeting. And Churchill comes up with a brilliant idea. He says to Roosevelt, he says, you know what, Franklin? I think for this invasion, we ought to have an American commanding this invasion of us and you all, and a few of the free French, by the way. And, by the way, your guy in England, Dwight Eisenhower, this is Churchill talking, Roosevelt. And he says, Franklin, we are very impressed with that. He gets along with everybody. He knows how to work with everybody. He's always got a smile. He's a good one. We ought to keep him, and I think he ought to come in. That's how Eisenhower got the job. So the first major decision they had between Roosevelt and Churchill. Um, Churchill wins. The invasion occurs. Now, here's another thing. Uh, Roosevelt just keeps urging them, hey, try to land before November, the election day. For guys' sakes, try to get over there and get started. Well, they don't make it. Uh, 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 Marshall tells Roosevelt about two weeks before, he says, uh, nah, it, uh, it's going to be November the 8th or something like that. Roosevelt never says it. But anyway, Roosevelt gets beat badly at the polls in that November. But had the men landed and had the invasion been started to fight the war, he probably would have done something better. But anyway, that's the second, um, the No Name Conference invade North Africa. That's where that decision was made. Um, then the third one, is a fascinating conference. It's a Casablanca. And Roosevelt decides that he's going to go overseas and he's going to be at that meeting. And he and uh, Churchill's, and it's going to be, it's in January 43. The invasion is in November of 42. So it's been going on a couple of months and we've had good success. Not over, but we've had pretty good success in North Africa. So, um, if they invite Stalin to come and join him, he won't come. Uh, so they meet Casablanca, and they are going to then make another decision about what they're going to do if they complete the North Africa campaign successfully. And one of the things that Roosevelt was a great man of history, and he studied the debacle of World War I. Um, he studied the debacle of World War I on the peace conference that occurred afterward and the League of Nations, which was a disaster. And he concluded that this war was so bad, and by this time, of course, the Russians are involved, and the killing is so awful, and there is some evidence of what's going on in Eastern Europe with the murdering of the Slavs and the Jews, etc. There's some of that evidence is, is now known by both Churchill and Roosevelt. And so Roosevelt decides we are going to do the same thing we did at the end of World War I, where we got everybody together that were the victors, and we all argued it out. And then we told Germany, here's what you're going to have to do. He decided we're going to have unconditional surrender. Now many of you no Civil War, no U.S. grant, unconditional surrender grant. So he decides that that's what we ought to do. And we'll then decide the victors, which is going to be England and the United States, and probably Russia. We'll decide what's going to happen to Germany, the three of us, not all the rest of the countries. And so he announces it at a press conference, of all things. There's actually a photograph of the press conference. Yeah. Churchill is blown out of the water. Like, he agreed to it in principle. 
but he thought there was going to be a lot more discussion. And at some point in time, he and Franklin would work something out. Well, Roosevelt said, it's going to be unconditional surrender. And they're going to surrender to the armies. It's not going to be a negotiated surrender. Not going to be the politicians with Hitler's representative. It's going to be our army, the Russian army, the British army, accepting surrenders of anything in front of them. So, second disagreement. Churchill didn't have his word. He didn't get, he didn't get much to say about that. Roosevelt wins that one. Okay. Then the third conference is the decision that was made was the invasion of Europe in 1944. Uh, it is a fascinating conference, and this thing has been written about, there's probably a dozen books written about this conference, because the Joint Chiefs of Staff meeting hammer out that they are going to invade Europe uh, sometime in 1944. What Churchill does is he disagrees with that all for all the reasons I mentioned to you. He wants to put it off. He wants to nibble around the edges and he says uh, he's not going to do it. Now he's not in the meetings with the military where they make that decision. He's meeting with with uh, Roosevelt and the other of the non-military members of Roosevelt's cabinet. They're talking about all sorts of things. And he then, while they're there at the conference, slips away and he, he yes, actually speaks to Congress while he's here. But he also talks to some people from England. He talks to some people, various other groups. And he tells them that, well, we kind of agreed in principle we're going to be but, uh, but I, that, that just isn't going to happen. We're going to do some other things. We've got some other things we're going to do. I'm going to show you that on the map, what those other things are. When Roosevelt hears of this, he calls Churchill in. He said, you know, I'm paraphrasing all this, but hey, Churchill, your men agreed, our military agreed, we're going to go in 44 somewhere and at some time. And now you're out here talking to people saying, well, it's in principle, we might go, we might not go. So he, face to face with Churchill, hammers it out, and Churchill finally agrees, yes. Okay, we're going 44. Where? We don't know. So mark that one up to Roosevelt. Then let's come down here to the Tehran Conference. Now, this is with Stalin in November, December of 43. And uh, and they finally get, they finally meet with Stalin. And they meet in Iran, in the city of Tehran. And it's the first time they get the big three together. And among other things, they say Stalin has been from the very beginning telling England and the U.S., I need a second front. I need you to do something major to take the pressure off the country. <coughs> and he's right. The current, the, the estimated dead of the Soviet Union in World War II until the last four or five years has been somewhere between 25 and 30 million were killed. Now some recent uh, Russian research says it's quite a bit less than that. But the point was Stalin's doing the slugging against the Wehrmacht and he's getting millions killed. We're fighting a little war down in North Africa. And, but he's the one that's really fighting the Germans. So at the conference, they say, yeah, we're going to invade in 44. Stalin does something that's very typically Stalin. He just kind of sits back, gets everybody's attention. He says, you know, uh, you don't invade any place. You don't put armies in the field to go do anything unless you have a command or somebody in charge. Who's in charge of this invasion? Well, nobody. And he gets very upset. He says, well, you aren't going to invade then until you have somebody in charge. Roosevelt then, there's a break in the meeting, or maybe it goes on a while, and then that evening I think is correct. Roosevelt gets his guys 
and he says, we got to tell Stalin who's going to lead the invasion. Now, there's another story we can't get into now about Marshall leading the American troops. We'll put that aside. Fascinating story. But he selects Eisenhower. So he tells, um, George Marshall writes it out on a slip of paper that Eisenhower will command the invasion forces in 1944. And that slip of paper was given to Stalin to read. Marshall got it back and later gave it to Eisenhower. It's now in the Eisenhower Museum in Alton, Kansas. So that's how Eisenhower commands the invasion of Normandy. And there's a whole lot to that about where they're going to go. At that time, they didn't know they were going to go to Normandy. They thought they were. But literally, from January of 44 until June 6 of 44, between the Brits and the Americans, they put together the entire invasion of Normandy. It's an incredible story of what they did. By the way, the documents relating to World War, or relating to Normandy, that are held by the Americans and the Brits, are over 18 tons of paper, <laughs> and I forgot how many millions of pages, and they're all stored in detail. So if you want to go read about it, <laughs> you can go read it. So that's so. Who wants this fight? Well, Roosevelt wants this fight. Essentially, what happens is that early in the game. 41, 42, somewhere along in there. Churchill dominates he's, because he's been fighting since 39. They stood alone for two years, basically, in this war. And Churchill has a tremendous amount of respect in his own country, and Roosevelt respects him. So early in the war, uh, Churchill kind of gets his way. But as the war progresses, first of all, he runs out of men. That's another story. And so we bring more and more men in. And at the end of the war, we have 8 million men in the service. And we have 16 million who served in the military in World War II. So we ramp up, and the arsenal of democracy ramps up on everything we, uh, that we uh, built, tanks, airplanes, ships, and so forth. We became the dominant power. And Churchill, by the end of the war, was just shaking his head, because that's all he could do. He was bankrupt. He didn't have any more troops. Montgomery had told him, uh, right after the invasion of Normandy, Montgomery was told by the, by the folks in England, he, was, he commanded the, you know, the British forces, that they, they couldn't replace the people who were getting wounded and killed. So by the end of the war, the number of Brits fighting the war went down. And as a result, Churchill's impact, Churchill's ability to influence, was not as great. So then um, this, this the Yalta conference occurred uh, again with Stalin. And, and it all related, by and large, to the, to the uh, they made final decisions on how they were going to occupy Germany and final decisions on how they were going to occupy Berlin and a bunch of other things that related to war crimes and so on and so forth. But basically it related to the vision of Germany. Um, and at that conference, um, now this is in February, and the war is over in May, Churchill is saying to Roosevelt, of course Roosevelt dies in the middle of this, and then he says, says to Eisenhower, We've got to move rapidly into Germany, and we've got to take over all the land we can to keep the Russians out. And, and that gets translated into Montgomery, who says to Eisenhower, give me command of the American forces, and I'm going to drive to Berlin, and I'll get there before the Russians. Um, and that's what that's what Churchill wanted to do. By the time the last year of the war occurs, Churchill's more afraid of the Russians than he is in some respects. What's the remnants of Germany? And he's awfully afraid that Stalin is going to 
take over potentially everything to the French border. And so he wants the Allied powers to move rapidly. And Montgomery says, I can get there for the Russians. Patton, on the US side, says, give them all to me. I'll get there for the Russians, too. Well, Eisenhower took a look at what they decided here on the division of Germany. And he says, if I, if I do what they're saying, and we go hell-bent for leather to get to Berlin, his, his estimates by his staff is that there would be 50,000 potentially more casualties from the U.S. side. And about 30,000 of that would be dead. And Eisenhower said, well, this doesn't make any sense. I'm going to go all the way to Berlin. I'm going to lose 30,000 people killed. And then I'm going to go withdraw. And I'm going to go back to the American sector that we're going to have. And so we're killing men needlessly. He says that to Marshall. Marshall, which is Marshall's his boss on the American side. Marshall agrees. They talk to Roosevelt. Roosevelt. So they don't do that. Churchill is living. Uh, very unhappy, and he never really forgives the United States for doing that. He, he's, Churchill's view, if we had done what he wanted to do, Poland would not have been under the Russians. Several of the Eastern European countries would have probably, Czechoslovakia most definitely would be, Hungary would have been. But because Roosevelt and Eisenhower and Marshall fell back, we ended up with what we had, that we lived with and still live with today. So Churchill again lost his arguments uh, as the result of, at, and, the, the, and some of this occurred uh, at this at this conference. Okay. I'm going to skip this because we're about out of time. Uh, it, 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 it simply is a chart that shows their military and political views. And, and you can see if you read it, Churchill believes one way, Roosevelt does another. But just briefly, Germany must be defeated <coughs> first. And certainly, uh, Roosevelt felt that. Uh, Churchill, oh, here's another big mis disagreement. England must retain its empire at all costs. And one of the things that Roosevelt said at the beginning of World War II, one of the things that's going to happen during World War II, is all of the powers that held uh, colonies, not the right word, are going to lose them all. Britain's going to lose the Commonwealth, which we now call Commonwealth. But her empire needs to go away. The Dutch, their empire needs to go away. The Japanese empire needs to go away. We need to get rid of these wealthy countries owning other countries. He believed that very strongly. And Churchill was highly offended because that was the whole English power structure for two, three hundred years was their countries that they controlled and the little country of England become quite wealthy because they owned half of Africa, and they owned Australia, and they owned New Zealand, and they owned India, and so forth. So that's another disagreement that I didn't have up here, but it's an interesting story. Uh, Churchill said Stalin must not be permitted to control Eastern Europe, particularly Poland. Why Poland? Because that's the reason Germany, or that's the reason England went to war. They had an agreement with Poland if anybody attacked Poland, England would come. So England goes to war because of Poland, and they have an affinity for Poland. They're bound to determine that Poland's going to stay independent. Obviously, they did. Um, I'm just going to skip the rest of it because uh, there's a lot more in here we can talk about. Okay, two, three minutes on this, and then we'll go to the Q and A. Um, here's Normandy. So the idea was the United States build up in England hundreds of thousands of troops over the course of two or three years. Send all the military equipment over there, etc. we can, men and equipment. And then we're going to take that whole entree and, every, and, and, and British troops that are there, and we're going to invade somewhere. And it was finally determined we're going to do Normandy, and that's Normandy. That's the Cotentin Peninsula 
and that's where they land. Now, um, you can't see it quite on the screen here, but this is North Africa. And this is what Churchill said. Well, let's invade North Africa and let's get the Germans out of North Africa. And then what we need to do is go to Sicily and take Sicily. The other one will nibble off a little bit more. And then the Italians, they're not a very strong country anyway, and they're, they're not a true ally of Germany. So let's invade Italy. And then when we get up here, maybe Italy or surrender, and then we'll concentrate right here. And the, and the Italian Alps and Swiss Alps are right here. And then let's land here, and let's go up what was Austria. Well, in Austria at the time, it had been annexed by Germany. And then we're going to be up, look here, we're going to be able to ride into Poland. And here the Russians are coming this direction, and we're going to beat them. And Eisenhower and Roosevelt said, no, particularly Marshall. So then they come up, Churchill said, that doesn't work. And so Churchill said, let's go down here in, uh, it's, not, it's an island that I've got the name right here. And they said, let's take this island. And Turkey is uh, neutral in the war. I think we can get her to come in on our side. And then between the British and Americans building up over here and bringing Turkey into war, we can go up this way. And the Russians are going this way, and we're going to beat them again. Marshall, <laughs> Roosevelt, Roosevelt said, no, we're not going to do that. Um, so the final thing is, part of Eisenhower's planning on d day and this was all agreed to by the British, by the way, initially, is that we're going to land here. And then, assuming it goes well, we don't get kicked off, and assuming we're fighting pretty good and doing well, then uh, what we're going to do a couple of months later, we're going to land down here on the what we now call the French Riviera. And then we're going to land troops here, and we're going to march up this direction, and because we're doing well here and we're about ready to go into Germany, these two forces are going to meet and then we'll overwhelmingly uh, move ahead. Um, Churchill opposed it. No, that was unnecessary. What he wanted to do again was take that whole bunch of, all of that that was intended to go in, this was called uh, code name drug Take all that bunch and go around Italy and come up and do this again. <laughs> and, and Eisenhower was finally the one that told him. No, he didn't even go to him. He just told him. Told him no. Um, one little more, one little anecdote here. Eventually, uh, Churchill comes to support the invasion of Norman overlord. But he tells Eisenhower, I'm coming with you. I'm going to get on the ship and I'm going to come with you. Eisenhower said, no, you're not. Now, he's telling the Prime Minister of England, no, I don't think you should. And then he's going back to Marshall and says, hey, Marshall, Churchill says he's going to go with me on the invasion. We don't need that. And uh, so Eisenhower does something. People sometimes don't really catch how good Eisenhower was. Eisenhower had an appointment with the king for some reason. And it was all legitimate. So he tells the king, hey, your prime minister wants to go on the invasion in a boat and land 24 hours after we land. And we, he can't do that. And the king said, let me take care of him. I'll take care of him. So the king calls Churchill up and he says, I understand you're going to try to go with the invasion. Yep, I'm going. He says, well, if you're going, I'm going. And Churchill says, okay. And the king says, my memory's correct, I'm your boss. And that ended that. Churchill <laughs> yeah, they ended up not going. So, enough said about the whole thing. It's a highly complicated issue, but you've got enough to see how it all ended up. Now, did they did Roosevelt and Churchill ever have bitter face-to-face knockdown drag out fights? Generally not. Yeah, there was letters exchanged, telegrams exchanged, a lot of dialogue one on one. And ultimate decisions made a little bit later. Um, Churchill uh, said the best friend that England ever had in all of its existence was, uh, uh, was Roosevelt. And Roosevelt thought the world of Churchill at the time. So, so enough said. Anybody got any questions?
that they want to ask about the whole thing? Well, my personal favorite is the, church, the Casablanca conference. Uh, the German board happened. But their sources were from French, from French sources. So when they translated Casablanca, they thought it was the White House yeah, in Washington, D.C., not yeah. in North Africa. Right. Uh, yeah, Devils, I think, was the one who was involved in some of it. Yeah. So they, they did, their intelligence was in some respects as good as ours. Yeah. But they translated Blanca. Blanca mean white? Right, yes. Yeah, it yeah. means white. It doesn't mean white house in English. Yeah, that, that never registered before. It made white house. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, there was a, that's a, the, probably one of the most fascinating conferences because the press was there. It's amazing. They, they, they end up here meeting to talk about the war, and you got literally hundreds of staff on both sides. They have a blanket and they wipe the press from the No, they haven't said in the meetings. But Roosevelt ends up having his press conference. And he, he works that out in advance before he leaves because he wanted to then use the, if he got his way, to use that conference as a public statement for the next year directions of the war. And we're leading, you know, Churchill and myself are leading it, and we're meeting in Europe. So, setting it, uh, wanted to make a statement. The President of the United States left and went to Europe to be a partner in North Africa to, to help, you know, illustrate to the Germans this is real stuff. Another question. Well, the, the other thing, you know, you mentioned how bad Britain was towards the end of the war. You have mentioned about how short Great Britain was for manpower. By the end of the war, they were drafting back into service men they had released in World 1917, 1918, that had been released for, because of wounds and putting them back on the front line. You know, when they were taking over the, I think it was Hamburg, uh, most, a lot of the men involved had actually been for World War I. Oh, at the end of the war? Yeah. yeah. Okay. But they, have, they were calling back men they had released for medical reasons in the First World War because they had lowered their standards so much that they had no manpower left. Uh, as a point of reference, the United States lost 480,000 killed and 420,000 And uh, between the Brits, World War I and World War II, it was 7,800,000 killed. And me? 7,800,000. And, and, and oh, I'm, I'm sorry, including the French. The French got slaughtered. Yeah, big time. So they lost a quarter million just in the uh, when the Germans invaded the second, you know, uh, who, you know, during the Blitzkrieg. I mean, their their losses were staggering during the Blitzkrieg too. Yeah. When it's when this particular war started in. Uh, before the United States joined it, did it start in the country of Poland, or where did it start? Uh, it started with Germany invading Poland on September 1, 1931. You mentioned that part, but I, I, where was the fighting happening? Was uh, it happening it was in Poland? Poland. Poland? It was in Poland. In Poland. Okay. And the invasion, um, they invaded, the, the argument was over, see there's a place right here, and after World Poland was created after World War I. Uh, and they took land from Germany, and I don't know where they got some land. Also. Well, that, and the Polish had a corridor to the sea. Now, what, what, this, what you really need is a map of pre-World War II, because Russia, after the war, wiped out East, what was East Prussia, forced all the Germans out of it. They gave them 30 days to get out or die. Part of that land became the part of Belarus, and part of Poland was taken away from them, and they in turn got part of East Prussia. Are you talking about the end of World War II? Right. Yeah. Got like a major yeah. population. Yeah, they just basically moved Poland to the west. Right. Yeah. And, and then Stalin took the stuff to the east. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, West Germans, during the, before the unification of Germany, I was I ran into some Germans. And their controversy was when they were asked to serve in the German army uh, under their peacetime draft, their 
their loyalty oath called for them to defend Germany. And they didn't know where Germany, what where the real German border was, whether it was the outer Nice or further uh, east. And they, but that was a controversy for them. And a lot of people refused to serve the German army. Said, "We don't know which border you're talking about." <laughs> well, all of this area right in here, uh, the last century, uh, has all been fought over, boundaries moved around, and the right of ways. So it's you know, I think your comments are right, very appropriate, very correct. Um, anybody else got any other questions? I got one more thing to cover with you before you do. You have a sheet of paper that's called, that talks about the founding of the World War II round table. That's this one. And I mentioned it briefly at the beginning, but I hope you'll take this with you. And I hope that if you have an interest, uh, let us know. You've got my phone number down at the bottom of my email address and we'll get you on a mailing list and so that we can, you can get invited to these programs coming up. Um, and if any of you want to volunteer to serve on any of our committees, we'll be happy to have you uh, to come and be a part of this. Um, we will meet once, the, the committees will meet periodically. The board meets every month. If you have an interest serving on the board or if you know of anybody, who's a big World War II buff, why uh, feel free to share with them or share their name with me. Uh, we're looking for board members. Uh, we're going to take the first 100 people that get in touch with us and want to support the program. Uh, we have charter memberships for $25 or more, cost of a meal, and um, you'll be listed as a charter member on our website or in any publications uh, that, we, that we have about the program. Uh, we have had the good fortune of having the Alpha chapter of World War II roundtables. There's about 30 of them in the United States. And the oldest and the best one is in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, they will average 150 to 200 people per meeting. They, they meet 11 times a year. And the guy who founded that gave us, what, Susan, half a day, maybe two-thirds of a day, visiting here to share with us how to start a World War II. They're somewhat similar to Civil War roundtables that you may be aware of. Um, but we're honored that the, that the museum has agreed uh, to, uh, it's named after Audie and Susan and the chairman of the board are ex officio members of the board of this organization. It is 501c3 of its own. But uh, anyway, we hope we can pick up some support from all of you in some form or fashion and just let me know we'll get from there. Thank you all. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much for coming today. We really appreciate it. And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, next month we actually won't have one because the 4th of July is on the Tuesday. So the rare times that happens we skip July because 4th of July everybody's off or they do the parade or something. So. So then we'll be back in August, um, first Tuesday in August, and um, I think that's it. Thank you guys for coming. I'm June, and you.